stuff's happening that may be of importance to you, even though a couple people did tell me, whoa, this looks kind of odd. Um, and I'm also really sorry I'm late and I missed John's presentation. I know we're gonna, we're gonna hook up later. I, I was at an exploratory committee and I'm madly looking for candidates for city council. Um, I think I found a good one. If she says she'll do it, I'll, I'll be telling you soon. Um, so that's where I was. Um, so I've talked to um, another council member about this and if you guys, if the community does want to put on the agenda, um, my recommendation would be to ask your local ACLU to write a letter and, and say what you want to put on the agenda and you know what you want to talk about, whether it's you know protocols for trying to control the behavior of the cameras or whether you want them at all or you know sort of you know I have a lot of respect for the ACLU and I'm something I've been doing lately is trying to remind the community the ACLU could serve this role locally at our council level and it certainly needs to be done by somebody. Um, so that, that would be my recommendation if you want to see it on the agenda. Have the ACLU write a letter request and then I'll, um, I'll work hard to agenda it. So other than that, I'm just here to be in the hot seat because I feel like, you know, uh, we didn't serve you well so far about this issue and, um, and to learn. Well, thank you, Micah, for being here. And thank all of our panelists for being here. Wonderful, uh, very informative. And now we're going to open this up for your questions to any or all the panelists about any of these uh, issues that concern you. Does anyone on the council know um, what's being done with it, what's planned to be done, if you're running off their inflation, what's planned to be done with these leaders as far as where the data goes? Typically, when the council gets a grant, the people that give you the grant want something, you know. And for example, police grants, typically they want to have data or information about what you're doing with their money, reasonably enough, you know, we're just giving you money, what are you doing with it? But in this case, the issue would be, are they collecting, it's one thing to have a reader that keeps information for a week to tell you that somebody robbed a convenience store and you might catch the car driving away from the scene of crime. They do that in England, if you watch TV, you see this, you think, hey, that's not a bad idea, you can catch people that way. But it's one thing to keep it for a week and then erase it because you know there's no crime happened this week that we need this for, and have it go away. Do we know anything now about whether the Santa Cruz police are sharing this data with somebody? How long they are going to plan to keep the data? Who they're sharing it with, and what their plans are for sharing it? What do we know right now? John, and then maybe Mike. Well, I asked the Santa Cruz Police Department this question in a public records act request, and I didn't get any information back about their policies, procedures, what they're envisioning for how long they're gonna collect data, who they're gonna share it with, who will have access to it, and what kind of system there will be for tracking who is accessing it. They didn't say any of that. As far as I know, no city council people asked that question, and no city council people have any of those answers either. Um, in contacting this director of the Northern California Regional Intelligence Center, I'm getting, I, I actually asked him, has a police department in Northern California ever said, we're not gonna give our data to you. We'll store it locally or something. No. Um, and 200 law enforcement agencies are already with uh, Nick Rick, Northern California Regional Intelligence Center. And he said he's had contact with Santa Cruz already, which means likely they'll connect with the 77 other regional intelligence centers across the United States, which connects with other uh, intelligence agencies. Micah? Yeah. I'm hoping, I'm hoping to get a specific answer, actually, and I've asked them again, the police department. And Micah, you have a response? Well, I already started apologizing, but I don't know. <laughs> it was a one-page staff report. It was, it was you know, termed as if this would be used for local crime. They specifically mentioned car theft. Um, and there may have been some vague language, but I'm pretty sure that there was no distinct protocols or, um, you know, council-led boundaries or directives on the information that would be gathered. There may be some vague language, but I'm pretty sure there's no specific boundaries on it. Um, um, which is why I'm willing to put it back on the agenda. <laughs> so I just quickly follow up, and I won't just, oh. just to say, so that's something very specific that we could ask the Santa Cruz Council to ask of the staff, 
what's going on in that area. Before we start to decide, you know, what we want to do, how we heat it, what, what part of it, what's going on, just get some basic information about what is the plan for these readers and where's the data going from them and how is it going to be stored and by whom. That's a question any council member could ask at a council meeting or any place in public and get a, if John can't get it by a nice request as a citizen, the council can certainly get that answer from the Santa Cruz Police or should be able to. And in fact, uh, um, we had uh, drafted and uh, put out on the uh, internet uh, an open letter from the people of Santa Cruz asking them to do specifically that, at least develop some kind of guidelines or have some staff report about the impact, potential impacts of civil liberties. So that is something that's being followed up by uh, some concerned citizens on the ACLU. Uh, another question, Gary. Uh, yeah, it shouldn't be a surprise because the fusion centers have been put together uh, layer by layer for a decade and for some councilmen that have been on there have been adopting these and what they're doing is nationalizing local police. The sheriff also now has a program formally with a website called Next Door in which you're supposed to have a neighborhood watch but it's under his control. Go to the website and you'll see the dangers of it immediately. Uh, response, uh, Micah? Yeah, I want to respond to Mike's comment. I, I am willing to try to dig for that. My guess is, and I'd love to hear from sort of you as a group or the ACLU chapter, is that you want more protocols and more boundaries about that. And if you do, it might be easiest if we put it on a council agenda and get that information ahead of time. I mean, I, you know, I could dig for it, but if we're going to put on the agenda, that's a very good public way to get the information. Yeah, I, that was one thing I didn't get to that was among my notes. Um, I'm concerned about how data from different um, collection avenues will be combined and ACLU nationally and um, different ACLU, ACLU groups around the country and EFF as well are saying, wow, when you have data from someone's cell phone, from someone's license plate, um, using predictive policing type yeah. stuff, and frankly just the notion of um, predictive is getting larger in local law enforcement and in the way the military works. And even the aspect um, of data being used as the primary way of finding where people are and doing things to them is problematic more and more. Um, it can be seen most dramatically with um, drones being used internationally where data is being used um, strike this place. And it turns out the people that were the targets, they weren't there, and there were other people there going to a wedding. Um, so that's a dramatic example, but the way that digital data is being looked at is evolving, and it's becoming more important than physical evidence and actually seeing what people are doing. And the idea of preemptive and predictive, um, I think we should be concerned about. And Santa Cruz is highlighted as the place that developed that. The shadowy kind of fuzzy definitions of what constitutes uh, a troublemaker or a war protester or a terrorist, or, you know, those definitions aren't very well defined. Colin, you have a brief response? Yeah, um, and so there's a phenomenon called confirmation bias where people tend to uh, lend a lot of credence to evidence which uh, supports their worldview and ignore evidence which doesn't, and that's a, a major problem with uh, this kind of bulk mass surveillance is that, and, and there's uh, been cases of this, uh, you know, with the FBI uh, investigating people where there was confirmation bias the whole way, oh, this guy's totally got to be a terrorist. And to the point that if you come across evidence that makes it look like he's not a terrorist, well, that's him hiding the fact that he's a terrorist, you know? And so, yeah, I, I think that's a major problem with the, the predictive policing in, and, and mass surveillance in general is that it uh, creates a scenario where uh, people are, uh, there, there's a, a general pervasive atmosphere of suspicion and people are being uh, criminalized based on that suspicion whether they've committed any crime or not. Accepting these, these license plate readers, you've got to understand that they're going to gather as much information as they possibly can, and they're always going to misuse it. Okay, so the real question that arises is, what do we give a shit about having these things for? 
Is, is there been a big, huge rash of stealing automobiles all of a sudden? Yes. Uh, you know, if there isn't. No, there isn't. Yes, so the, 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 fact, the fact of the matter is, this comes from the national government offering a grant to do something they want to do. It's not something that the local community has any real need for. That, you know, it's no more. That, that whole idea that they come in with some kind of narrow excuse for using these. The fact of the matter is the entire national security surveillance system that they have with the FICA court and everything else, there have been studies that have been done on this in ACLU National that I used to work for, knows perfectly well what these things do, that the protocols have been put in by Congress emphatically, and in fact they've shown that on 22 separate occasions that the FBI has used information that is tightly controlled under these protocols for, for anti-terrorism and use them for typical garden variety law enforcement. And there's not any chance at all that they won't violate these and any discussion of putting protocols on is completely useless. So you really need to make a decision as to whether or not you want to have these things in the community and gathering information on where everybody is following you all the way into your driveway to see who's getting out of the car with you. Because I can tell you, if they can do it, they will do it. Mm -hmm. but, 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 I would totally oppose. What you just said was that a lot of the people on the city council are concerned about public safety. The problem is, is that what Danny Sheehan was saying, that this has nothing to do with public safety. And if it, it can be brought to their awareness, that it's not that it's really about homeland security, about tracking us, about it's more, it's bigger. It's, I guess I don't even understand. Put us all in jail. What do you say? This, uh, yes, sir. Uh, can you? I, I apologize, Abby. I was trying to get. The, I really want this thing from John, but I apologize. Who's going to listen, Barry? Can you finish up? When I said that I wasn't paying enough attention about this issue, I mean it. However, I have paid a lot of attention about a lot of civil rights issues that have come under the guise of public safety, and there's been many of them. There's been a rollback of freedom of assembly. There's been an attack on people that stand on medians, which to me is freedom of assembly. There's been, um, gosh, the huge list, um, an attempt to stop people from displaying their creative activities downtown on Pacific by limiting the amount of space they have to make it impossible. So. It's not that I'm asleep about civil liberties. In fact, to some extent, it's that I know so much about local issues that I get overwhelmed. Um, and almost all of these attacks on civil rights have come under the guise of public safety. And unfortunately, I have some reason to believe that at least some of the council members, at least some of the time, do understand that the, the proposals and the motions they're making are not about public safety, but they're making them anyways because the category of public safety is a convenient one if you have other goals in mind, whether that's population control or class, you know, some sort of goal to help one class over another, or, you know, just to have your city look. children. Okay. If, you have, if you want your city to look a certain way. So public safety is, can be, and is at least to some degree, used as kind of a Trojan horse for a whole bunch of different agendas. It plays on our fears. Um, it plays on people's fears. So, um, and our, the community that's standing up against that concept is not particularly strong. I'm really glad to see you here today. I hope you work strongly on this. The city council, there's a very vibrant movement for, quote, public safety, unquote. And if you want to have some control over it, you're going to have, we are going to have to organize, 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 and have our priorities be present in the city. Sir? Well, it seems that this is both a local and a national issue. This came to you from a staff report. Behind the scenes, there had already been negotiations about the uh, funding for this, and she was talking about the way the staff has their own agenda. What we're looking at, isn't what we're looking at a, a, a culture of de facto government that pervades our entire nation and down to the local level? What is going on with the, with the police and the fusion centers? What kinds of bonds of allegiance are created there? What kinds of agendas are set that we don't have any idea about that come to you at the at the city council as just you know a nice little uh, proposal on a on a white page and uh, you don't even know what's going on behind it. 
So this, this is going, the sheriff said that he's proud to work with the federal government. Yeah. <laughs> this is going on, and, and, and regional government, where we have local officers from the city council going on to AMBAG and, and, and talking about agendas that have nothing, that are not presented to the local community, that are not transparent to us. How, how do we take care of this culture that has pervaded us into the marrow of the, our, our national government and well, the local government. Your instrument for trying to affect the staff is the city council, which is why it's totally proper to put me on the spot. And it's it's a subtle thing the way the government works because the staff they try to do actions that they think they have support for on the council. So if we had a council where a priority was civil rights and the police or other agencies were doing things that that in our mind were not following that priority then you would want the, you would be asking the council to stand up more. In this particular moment in time in Santa Cruz, I hate to tell you, but that's not the case. The majority of the council is not prioritizing civil rights, and so you can't blame the staff when they're following what they rightly perceive as the priorities of the direction of the council. First, you need to get a council, like we've had in the past, that really highly prioritized civil rights, and then you need to put us on the spot and say, how are you actually watching the staff and governing, but I, I, this is this is the truth, the unvarnished truth, that we haven't got to step one yet because, you know, a majority of council clearly says that public safety in the broadest defined terms is their priority.